But as I speak to you today, and as I tell you that there is not one person in more than 20 years who I have had the privilege of sitting with or communicating with, who has presented something about themselves that they have been deeply concerned about, that has been hugely problematic to them, that have worried about their addictive behaviors, about the isolation that that brings to them, about the deep hurt that's underlying it all. There is not one individual that has continued to remain in that state of being as once they did. And I'm going to repeat again what I said to you just before that. That is not arrogant speaking. That is simply because my sitting with another without judgment and only with allowing enables the beauty of life to become present. And that present is freeing. That present sets the heart alive. We need the emphasis of the truth of who we are to be constantly repeated because of the ingrained lie about life that we've been filling ourselves with, convincing ourselves otherwise that that's my lot in life. I drew the short straw. It was just in my genes. My father was an addict. His father was before him. Guess what? So am I. That's a lie. That's a complete and utter lie. Even science, which doesn't always get everything right either, begins to realize this now. The whole myth of addiction being a lifetime sentence just because you were born into a family unit that had such a debilitation already written into the gene code has well and truly been debunked, and we'll look at that somewhere, of course, in the course of today and tomorrow. Suffice to say, though, that as long as you keep allowing, and as long as you just keep some attention on that myth, on that lie, and bring presence more fully back into your life, that whatever was once so troublesome will simply disappear, disappear. My teaching to you this day is that as conscious awareness expands, addictions dissolve. Because they're only behaviors. Behaviors that seem so very, very real and will continue to do so until they're not. When I've worked with those in addiction over all of the years that I now have, there's one commonality a thread that runs throughout. The sense of belonging and really feeling at home in mind and body has never ever been there for the person that goes on to have long, 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 long times of their addictive behaviors. The reason being that their long, long, long time of addictive behaviors continue, of course, is because they need to self-soothe. The shock of that they really do. It is a shock to the system. We are spirit, spiritual beings, learning now how to have this human experience. And yet, as soon as we land on Earth, so to speak, already the walls of that are determined and come in very, very small. And the insistences become very, very great. And then it's all about, are we going to be able to make it? Are we going to be able to win over the very beings that we've actually put in place of our source, namely parents or our loved ones, looking for their acceptance. Now, in many cases, I've worked with those who have been very severely abused right from the outset. And so, of course, the walls of that individual's life will be very, very narrowed indeed. The shock to the system it's horrendous. But even when that's not the case, deep hurt, trauma from deep hurt is always there. It's always there, even if it's simply the shock of, I've never really felt I belonged. Why don't people really understand me? I've tried really hard to fit in. They just don't get me. 
I, I am working hard at this, you know, but it, uh, somehow or other, I've never really felt at home sufficient in my human body. I may have as well being, being invisible. That's a very, very, very common thread. And so there is a self-loathing about the individual who, of course, just looks to self-soothe that introduction into our human existence. So it doesn't take rocket science to understand why people go to extraordinary lengths to hurt themselves, but thinking it worthwhile enough just to ah, wonder if there's something else. There must be more to me than I'm experiencing, looking, desiring all of the time for that little escape route. Totally understandable. Totally understandable. I want you to really get that. Addictions are not failures. Nothing in life is failure. No thing in life is failure. But I want to put that into a nutshell, because here is basically what happens to every one of us spiritual beings who start the process of learning how to have a human experience. In the first early months as babies, and those of you who had babies, those of you who enjoy looking at babies, those of you who've never looked at a baby in your life before, have a look at a baby next time you see one. You'll find that they're absolutely amazed at their fingers. They can look at them for long periods of time, fascinated by the movement of their digits. After a little while, they'll begin to explore further. Hands into the mouth, experiencing the feel of that, seeing what that feels like, widening their sensory perception. Fascinating to watch. A spiritual being beginning to have a human experience. While that is happening, and of course, everybody paying full attention to the newly born, oh, everybody loves the newly born baby, and you know, even if you've had the parents from hell, guess what? They'll still be showing you off. This is the newborn baby. Everybody takes full attention. And what is going on in that period of time, in that short, short period of time, there are as many as 10 billion what are called synapses. They're the neural network of the, the brain. And Jeannie might bring up that little caption because it's, it's good to, to have a little image of what the neural pathways of our brain begin to look like. And they're forming networks of communication, 10 billion buzzing away whew, with all of the different experiences that the newborn is experiencing, stimulus of every kind. People's voices, my British voice as opposed to your American accent, a Spanish accent, a new face, an ugly face, a happy face, you know, a noise, a sound, the billions. The billions of them, look at them, wow, wow, spreading, forming what are called synapses. They're really little junctions, and then another whole little strand of them beginning. All of the time networks, all of the time stimuluses, all of the time new learnings, different senses. Very, very exciting period. Within the first two years, 1.8 million synapses per second are being formed in a child's life. Amazing. Wonder, this is what it's going to be like to live within a human body, even in this family, even with the mother from hell. I'm going to give it a go, okay? Because I'm a spiritual being, and I signed up for this one. So let's try and see how it goes. That's all happening. It's all happening. Of course, the baby at that time doesn't have language, and so it doesn't have thoughts. It doesn't know where it begins and where it ends. They're just concepts. It doesn't know what a concept is, of course. It's just in its existence. Life is just lifing it. It's not having to do anything. It's not having to prove anything. It's just wonder, wonder. Then, 
And I've got to tell you a rather shocking thing. Because within another two years, almost 50% of those neural pathways, those junctions, those new discoveries, are unceremoniously culled, if you like, whew, half before the age of about four years old. Why does that happen? Well, the new kid on the block's no longer that new. There's no real necessity to be showing the baby off in quite the same way as parents maybe did. People have got used to its crying and its demands and its requirements. There's not a lot new happening around it. There's not the attention given that was once felt all necessary. And the synapses decrease by half. Now you might think, well, what's the significance of that? Well, it's major. It's major. Because how we feel, how we taste, how things sound, how things look, they're all interpreted from that time on as how life is. Our reality about life, depending on the impacts, the influences, the introductions, the insistences, the demands, the peculiarities that are being given to us and required of us, and our readiness to try to make it work. See to it that that becomes our reality. And it remains our reality until it doesn't. Just until it doesn't. So you can see that our starting place in life is considerable. You might have seven people in the family, and each of the seven children, even though the same parents, same experiences, same impacts, same stimuluses, but all interpreted very uniquely by the individual. All seven different realities of how life is. Those who have constant difficulty with addiction are those who have the constant need, perceived though it may be, to self-soothe that rather shocking awakening to make it feel less unbearable and more possible. And we try very hard. We try very, very hard. Our education systems reinforce it because of the little pattern that I've just described to you. If we're introduced to religious practices, it's there again. This is how we do things. This is how not to do things. This is how you've got it right. This is how you got it terribly wrong. This will work. This is totally unacceptable. Whatever culture you begin from, it's going to be pitted with that too. And so it goes on and on and on. The myth of life and our trying to make something that didn't work, couldn't work, will never work, work. And that's why there's the constant need to self-soothe. Yes, okay, so you've heard enough about the book Addiction Unplugged, or maybe you haven't yet. So I'll tell you a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to read to you just the first introduction. It's actually an author's note. We can all hand our, over our lives to someone or to something. As soon as we do this, we give to that someone or that something a power and an authority over us which diminishes our individuality and depletes us of energy. You have been doing precisely that with your life. It's why you've been relying so heavily on drugs, alcohol, or other addictive behaviors to sustain you. The fact that you're now in possession of this book is your indication that you have either exhausted that particular dependency, taken it as far as you can, or that your dependency has exhausted you. 
Either way, life is inviting you to make the personal transformation your heart has always desired for you. I know that to be true from my own life experiences. In the past, I handed over much of my life to other people and to other things, similarly depleting my own personal energy until I reached the point of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual breakdown. I could not possibly be speaking to those of you who have recognized addictions or those of you who have been affected by the addictions of another if I were not speaking as though I were separate, not only from the source of life that sources me, but that I could think that I was for a moment separate from you. Because as Adamus was reminding us just before, that would be the greatest illusion we could ever buy into, that we are actually separate. And yet it is the one, as I was teaching you, reminding you earlier, is the very one that the pull of life, the pull of the world, the pull of other people, the pull of those who need that power controlling authority over us, or so they think, has us actually scurrying around and trying to fit, trying to make work. And of course, it doesn't work. There are some beautiful stories in this book, and when I say stories, I mean they are real life people, like you, like me, who have gone through their addiction challenges and have actually discovered how different life is when we do become more consciously aware. When we have, as another way of putting that, discovered how to give ourself, small less, back to ourself. The truth of who we really are. Jean, you might be kind enough to put up my favorite picture image, if you would. Oh, beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? That's my great nephew, Aidan. Aidan is very special to me because whatever I would be sharing with you today or tomorrow is courtesy of Aidan. Because I was encouraging each of you just to take stock. Next time you see a baby, look at the baby. Really take notice of this new being that comes into the world and is exploring all of the time its new found bodily self. Fingers, first of all, digits, and then all the rest come after that. Discovers a concept, discovers where they begin, where they end. And if we really are to take notice of the new child, the new being, we'll realize that it knows nothing at all about addiction. It knows nothing at all about inadequacy. It knows nothing at all about incompleteness. It knows nothing at all about inadequacy, nothing at all about fear. It knows caution, but not fear. And Aidan, who's now five years old, three, year, three and a half years old when I actually put the book together, did an enormous amount for me in my life. Because in observing this being full of life, did not know anything other than connectivity to the life-giving force that he was and is, has taught me how much I had forgotten to remember. Because we do, until we don't. We forget and we forget and we forget until we don't. And that's why I'm speaking to you today, not to forget to remember the source of life that is sourcing you, the truth of who you are. See, oddly enough, in 
the book Addiction Unplugged, I have used the term quite a lot. That's how powerful you are. And I did that very, very deliberately because everything else in life, particularly in the whole gamut of addiction treatments, addiction recovery process, addiction counseling, addiction therapies, is all about how powerless you are. So it was incredibly important for me to at least, you know, readjust the imbalance of that. Aiden is, like the clocks would show, very, very much in the now. Because he's only five years old. You were when you were five years old. Didn't bother about the past. Certainly didn't bother about what was happening tomorrow. For t even now at five, talk about what we might do tomorrow is totally alien to Aiden. If it's not happening now, it's just not happening. Right? The, ex the exhilaration of that. It's phenomenal. And if we miss it, we miss everything about ourselves. That's why he's such the great teacher that he is. When, as time goes on, we unfortunately forget to remember the essence of the truth of who we really are, a very strange thing comes into play. We call it guilt. Adamus has spoken about it a little bit already. Guilt is the most peculiar, it's sometimes called an emotion, but you know, I'm wondering if you could even put it alongside the other emotions. It's almost the one that sits underneath every one of the other emotions. Because it's the constant confusion between our true nature, which Aidan has still not forgotten to remember, because he's only five years away from the source of life that sourced him. So there's still enough of that very, very much alive and active in his being. And yet he's five years away already from it. And so do you know what? Even my beloved Aidan is beginning to lose something of that essence. Because he lives, as we all do, in a human form, in a body, with a mind that has been pulled in every other direction as we learn to compete just to be the beings that we are. It's quite ridiculous, of course, when we consciously aware, step back from it and see it for what that drama is. But that's what we have all been doing. And we'll do it until we don't. And if it takes this lifetime and another one and another one, so it is. But your preference, as it would be in mine, that we actually get it in the here and now. And the beauty about working with those who are in addiction, for me, has been that, like Aidan, they too have taught me so much more about me. So it's been give and take all the way. I haven't actually had any difficulty sitting with the person who's been through the most horrendous experiences in their life and have given everybody else the greatest headaches that you could possibly imagine. Why? Because I recognize their beauty, trying to keep their magnitude, like Aidan is constantly expressing, in a tiny, tiny little version of themselves. And that leads to immense frustration, immense frustration. You see, you know exactly who you are. I know that. I don't have to convince you of that. I don't have to convince anybody here in the studio that. You know it. There's a knowingness that never, ever goes away. There's the same knowingness that Aidan has never yet even had to bring into his reckoning. He's never even had to figure it out. He just knows that life is lifing him. It's lifing him. And there's such a joy to actually take part in his world because his world does not have restriction about it. And if I have anything whatsoever to do with Aidan's continuation, that's the way it will remain. So we'll make a great partnership. He's my teacher, I'm his teacher, and that's the way life works, if we allow it. I have had several... <laughs> 
interesting. Jobs jumps out of bed to in various addiction treatment centers. Some of them are good. Some of them are awful. Most of them were awful because they were about limitation. And I scribbled down, I saw one on the internet just this morning. And this is a typical, a typical kind of philosophy, if you like. It's their marketing, oddly enough, for their addiction treatment center. It's the complete antithesis, the complete opposite of anything I've been sharing with you so far. It's what I would call not evidence-based anything other than evidence-based fear-mongering. Here's the first thing that they have right across the top of their website. Leaving treatment is hard. Hmm? According to whom? 30% of those discharged will slip. That means go back into their behavior again. At least once within 30 days. 23 to 35% will be readmitted to treatment within a year. Really hard work already, isn't it, this? 50% of people who complete treatment will be readmitted within five years. 80% of those who attend inpatient treatment facilities will relapse in the first year. Of this, 80%, 9 out of 10 will relapse in the first 90 days. And oddly enough, do you know what? People still go to that treatment center. <laughs> They'll be signing up for it week after week after week, still thinking from their victim mentality that that place has possibly got something as an authority to offer them that they didn't have in the first place. But when you go to a lot of those treatment centers, when you sit with an addiction counselor, if you're listening and you are an addiction counselor, please consider one of two things. Come out of your job altogether, or at very least, change the title that you're describing yourself as being. Because as long as you think you're counseling addiction, how can addiction ever be gone? How can it ever be gone? Give it a different, give yourself a different, you know, breathe and breathe again. Chambre, if you are already in that role, if you are wanting to be the compassionate being that you are in the presence of another, think carefully about what role you similarly settle for because there'll be a victim mentality in that, still running the show until you question it and then choose again. The person in addiction is a being, a being, being, being. You know, when we say an addict, it's like we're talking about a, an ant, a bug a nuisance. Okay, their behavior, of course, can be highly annoying. Why? It's disturbing you, isn't it? That's all. That's all. And maybe it's about time you were disturbed. Thank the being. Thank the being. He's, or she is, invited you to Come out of your own deep sleep and wake up. Wow. Now I can feel your hurt, but now I understand why it could be. And if I can feel your hurt and understand why it could be, there must be something in you for me to recognize that in me. Thank you very, very much for helping me not to miss that. Addiction recovery, the need to be in recovery. Recovery, you know, wow, again, it's one of those illusions if ever there was one. A recovery to, from what to what? From what to what? A person has to know, for, well, what is it? What is it then? What am I going to get from this? 
in most people's mindset is, oh, right, okay, wife thinks, oh, well, my husband's not drinking anymore, great relief. And I don't question that. It is a great relief if your life has been made hell when husband has been drinking. But there's far more to it than that. Because as I was saying to you a little bit earlier, life doesn't judge. Life has got no agenda. And it's as much an invitation to wife in this case as it is to husband in this case to grow and to expand. There's nothing more debilitating, more challenging, more difficult to get through and to manage for an addict about wherever they've become addicted to than it is for the family member to let go of their limitation. We're all in the same boat. You know, it doesn't just work one way. Know that. Know that. If you're a family member, know that. Life is forever inviting us just to expand. As I was saying before, love your parents, love your partner, love your child, and go beyond them. That's the invitation. Come on, there's more to you than this. There's more to you than this. That's what life is saying all of the time. Don't miss it. When there is what we call addiction, and when we think it just belongs to another, and we have failed to recognize that it actually is about our whole selves and about how we viewed life, about how we formed beliefs about ourselves and about life, about how we formed thoughts about ourselves and about life, about how we form behaviors about ourselves and about life, about how our life situations have developed and how life's situations develop in another. There's judgment that runs right through the core of it. Because all the while, we're thinking that as long as somebody else gets their shit together, I'll be more okay. Back to what Adamus was teaching us about, vying for power. It's killing us. Life is expecting, demanding as much from you, the family member, you, the addiction counselor, as it is you, the person who thinks they are the only ones who have all the problems. Discover. Discover the truth of who you are. And that's immensely freeing. See what the person in addiction in your life is inviting you to discover more about you. At very least, they'll be teaching you who you're not. Who you're not. As soon as you discover more about who you're not, immediately conscious awareness comes into play and you begin at least to discover a little more about who you are in the world, in this human beingness that we're being, we have all much to discover yet about passion and about compassion, about who we're not and about who we are about how we've, who we've learned to become and who we truly are. And the confusion between the two is guilt. That's what guilt is. Guilt's nothing about doing something wrong. That's how it's being construed. This person, you know, who's being caught having a little drink of beer when they weren't supposed to be drinking, feels guilty. Why? Because you've not met the expectation of the person who was the authority and hadn't given you the permission slip to do that. Otherwise, another person without that guilt has a drink of beer, has another drink of beer, because they're not carrying that fearful limitation. Where did the fearful limitation come from? It was learned. It was learned. Now I tell you, if I'm, if I'm speaking that to a parent about their son or their daughter, they immediately can I go into fear again. Up go the, the armors. 
because they'll say, but we've been really good parents. Are you telling me that I've been a bad parent? You know, are you blaming me? I, I brought him up to the best of my ability. I've always been lovely with her. She has, she had everything she wanted. He's always been given. You know, if we've gone to the, they'll give you all of that stuff. That's their own fear. That's just their own fear. That is just their own limitation. That's them simply just missing life's invitation for them to know that they too can love their parents and go beyond them. Just the same. Just the same. How do we miss the obvious? What I'm speaking to you, you know, is common sense. But the trouble with common sense is it's not very common. It's not very common. Who would you be proving wrong if you were without your addiction. Now, stay with me on this one. Because at that point of realization, that can be, whoa, 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 just a bit too scary for the individual to take on. Because the authority that we have given to that other, whoever that other is, can seem just a little bit too daunting for us to upset. Nobody likes to upset their mother. You know, she's getting old. I don't really like to trouble her with, I don't like, I, the addict, right? Don't like to trouble my mother by saying, could you possibly think of something a little bit differently to the way you've been thinking of it? But that's what happens when you have built up a, a self-loathing enough about yourself that you haven't enough authority to stand and be the soul that you are and ask the other individual who's part of your life, would I be proving you wrong if I did not have my addiction? Wrong about the estimation that you made of me? Wrong about the expectations that you had of me? Wrong about the demands that you would really rather I was fulfilling differently? And even if I did, would that be okay? Would that be okay? We have to give ourselves more permission. And even if it is uncomfortable to the authority that we have given such authority to, See, at the very same time, that it's no less an invitation from life to you as it is to the other to expand and to grow. To expand and to grow. That's all there is to it. To expand and to grow. When you're next in the company of someone who is struggling, and that their struggle appears to be pulling the very life out of you, demanding that they have full attention of you, so much so that you feel that something of your greatness is going into their demanding smallness. Don't let that be depleting of you in any way, shape, or form, because it's only their illusion as well. Come back from it, no matter what authority you had given to them in the first place. Take a nice deep breath, love them, but go beyond them, and they will do the same. They'll come with you, because that very same person is waiting for the very same authority to come from life, which as it happens, is going to come through you, just like it's coming through me, to everybody listening to this message today, which makes that particular book Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free, is a very, very, very freeing message indeed. <laughs>